Psalm 92, 5 through 9. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindred of people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Thank you. And the scripture we're going to focus on the most is the one Miss Lois has, Colossians 3, 23 through 24. Read it on the uh, New American Standard Bible. It says, whatsoever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the reward of uh, inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Thank you. The New English version of that says, whatever you do, work it with all your heart as working for the Lord, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Today I wanted us to focus on this idea of I will work for the glory of God and in faithful service as far as what we do in the church. I think that in our faithful service in the church that first we have, for me, I believe there are two tenets that we have to stand by with our relationship with God and then there are other tenets that I will note that I think have to do with us in reference to how we are with each other. The first tenet I think we have to remember of his faithfulness, service to God is that we have to trust him with that. If God does all things for our good and he does, then demonstrate our trust in him, putting his nature and character on display. Jesus left the tools to do this. And our church work, we have to trust that God is in the midst of all the work that we do, whatever the work that we do. I think that sometimes we leave a lot of the work to the pastor, to the elders, to the deacons, to the deaconess, and if you are, and if it's for our children, the Sabbath school teachers, we leave a lot of the work to those that we see in church leadership. And yet we don't trust that God will give us a ministry to do within the church and to minister to others. And I think we have to trust God even more on those things and things he's called us to do. I think also we have to be very prayerful in anything that we do in service to God. I think sometimes we don't align what we want to do, making sure it's aligned with what God wants. I think sometimes we want to do something and we haven't prayed to God on if it's something we should do. And I had your prayer shine some spotlight on God's attributes of goodness and omnipotence. The Lord encourages and invites us to call upon me in the day of trouble and I will rescue you and you will glorify me. He adds, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, says the Father, and glorify him in that. So I say before anything in our church where we first have to trust God and we have to be trusting God in that. Now I have some notes here about how we interact with each other in being faithful in our work to God. I have noticed here, be faithful in your duty to receive a promise. A promise is something we should do. And I think sometimes in our church work, we act as though we have not made a promise to do what we said we would do. We will show up to work on time. We will get to doctor's appointments on time. But yet we won't make it to do the work of God on time and in a timely fashion. We struggle, but those that are here are faithful. But if we notice, we have more people that attend church, but we don't all come to Sabbath school. We're not as faithful in the promise to God and doing what he's asked us to do. And I'm not saying it's to intimidate the building, but I wonder sometimes if we showed up at work as we show up at church, would we still be employed? So we need to be faithful in our promise and doing the work that we're doing. If we're going to say that we're going to be a deaconess, a deacon, an elder, or whatnot, we have to be faithful to that promise. Being in church leadership is not haphazard. I can say myself, trust me, as Sabbath school superintendent, there are many Sabbaths. My aunt can tell you that on Friday night I've told her I don't want to get here in the morning. But it is a promise that I have to keep. Because how am I to say that God is good and I yet can't wake my rump up on Sabbath morning and get here on time to commit to what I said I was going to do? Second one is do not overextend without guidance from God. I think sometimes we jump out and do things and we haven't talked to God about whether we're committed to do those things. I don't think that everything in the church is meant for everyone, and I think it's okay to say no. Faye has asked me every time she's looking for new children's 
do children's um, stories in Coastal Library, and I emphatically tell her no. It's not because I don't think children's stories are important. It's just not my ministry. And I'm not going to do it just because she needs someone. She needs people where that's their ministry to teach the kids. Now, I don't know how, much, how many more no's she's going to let me say because I do teach cradle roll, but I still stand, I don't overextend in that. And I think we need to be honest about that. When we say we're going to do something, make sure God has guided us on that. Next one, be just and honest in all our dealings with people. We have to be fair with each other. Now, we all have our quirks. There are some of us that just aren't going to like each other, and that's fine. We don't have to like each other. We just have to be respectful and love each other in the Lord. But we need to be honest and fair with how we deal with each other. Because, again, we're a body of people. We need to be fair in how we deal with God's business. So I think we need to keep that in mind. I have here, be okay with your only reward being heaven. Because the church does not support you in what you're doing does not mean it's not a ministry worth doing and being a part of. I think sometimes we do, and it's, it's hurtful when you want to do something and you don't have church support, but I think we have to remember every ministry is not the church's ministry. And sometimes those of us, it will be one or two that will do God's work and that will be it. But that doesn't mean don't go forward with that ministry. I want us to know that. Also, I have in, in guidance with that, church support does not make or break your calling. It's not personal. If the church doesn't support you, it doesn't mean that it's not a good thing. There are many ministries, even in the church, where there's not church support. How it would be, how hard it would be if we didn't do it because the church doesn't support it. I have a few Sabbath school teachers. How hard, it would be horrible if I thought because I didn't have everybody supporting the children's ministry in Sabbath school that it wasn't a ministry that was important. So I think we need to remember that. And the last thing that I have is, your vision must not be fulfilled by the church. God will provide your resources. I bear, I remember, this was when I was a law school student many, many moons ago. I was the leader of the Black Law Students Association. And it was in my heart that when it was time for us to take our exams, I remember I approached Mr. and Mrs. Knapp if they would help me in creating a study box. And it was just snacks and a little card and a word that the Lord loves you. That was my ministry. I didn't go to the church board about it. I didn't ask the church board to give me money for it. I didn't ask the church if they would support it. It was a ministry I felt that God had put in my heart to extend what I knew about the God I served to individuals that were at my campus. That was a very important ministry to me, and the students were very pleasant about it. There was a dinner that was at the Maps house, and many of my classmates, even though I didn't necessarily go to church on Sunday and I wasn't Baptist, they were like, she's a really cool person. Because we also, that Saturday evening, they got to know what this Sabbath is about. And that I don't go to this weird church with these weird people, but that we're the same. That was my ministry. I didn't get any support from the church board or the church. I didn't even bring it to the church. I would, we have to remember in doing what God has called us to do, it's not always for the church to support it or to give money towards it. It's for us to do the work. Because I believe that God will give you all the resources for you to accomplish it. So those are just some I, those are some things I have as far as our faithfulness. I want us to understand that we serve a God that is consistently faithful to us. And though we'll fall short on that faithfulness, we should be faithful to him. Our church is as good as we make it. Our church is as powerful as its members. The church is not a building, it's the people. Um, my aunt yesterday, she went to do the food ministry. We have to know that that's an important ministry. But if it's not the food ministry, that doesn't mean it's not important. Because it's not a ministry where everyone attends, it doesn't mean it's not important. Everything that God has placed in us, whatever vision we have, we need to go out and do it and be faithful in it. So my prayer this year and years ago that we're more faithful to doing God's work. Go ahead. Take it. Hey, uh, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking that an important aspect that is not particularly mentioned is why we serve. It is the motivation to build ourselves up in front of of our church members, or is it just to serve God where he believes he has placed us? And I think anyone, we, we, there have been a few that I have known that have been in this church that I think serve to build themselves up where we know whatever we do is nothing if we don't have Jesus in our heart. And the reason we serve is because we love God and we want to, we want to further his message, his ministry on this earth and that he's chosen us to do that. And it's not about 
building ourselves up in the eyes of them and seeing the person who did all that doesn't work. Um, and also I want to say if we, for those of us that work in the church, I think sometimes we need to be thankful. We don't say thank you to people for the work that they do. We don't say thank you for the people that do the um, lunch. We don't say thank you to our teachers. We don't say thank you for the people that do for um, an example. Did, did we say thank you to Miss Lois and Miss Barbara for the ministry they did at the fair? Do we just say thank you to each other for the work that we do, whatever it may be, because all of it works for the glorification of God and for us moving forward to be connected. And I think that sometimes we get so caught up in what we're doing that we forget that it's not one person in one ministry that's going to lead us to heaven. It's all of us doing what we need to do. So I want us to, one, we need to trust God, we need to be prayerful, and we need to honestly have a conversation with God about the faithfulness. And what is it that I can do? I remember, she resting in Jesus now, but I remember Miss Melba, years ago, she sent me a little card when I graduated from law school, and I'll never forget it. And Miss Melba, I mean, then you was in her 80s, so clearly Miss Melba and I were on two different ends of the spectrum of age, identity, many things. But I remember when I had a conversation with her and I just told her, I said, you know, Miss Russell, I'm just proud to see a young woman that serves the Lord. And it's dear to me because Miss Melba, my aunt, knows she was the sweetest thing. She was the sweetest thing and she always found a way to just say thank you. And in the little things she did, she would send cards. She wasn't one of the members that could be here for Wednesday night prayer. She was, she was a senior member, but she contributed where she was. And I think we have to remember that faithfulness is that we do what we can when we have to. So I want us to consider that as we go through our days, know that God is faithful to us. Sometimes we don't even think, we don't know what God, we don't know what our angels had to fight for us to even wake up this morning. We don't think about that. I always tell my aunt says she wished she could sleep like me. I'm a heavy sleeper. So I can only imagine that death for me is just me sleeping every night. That's what it is. I don't know what's going on that keeps me moving throughout the night that I have not just gone on and resting in Jesus. So I think we need to understand the faithfulness of God being faithful to our church, our church members, and just growing in the different ministries that are in our heart. I think we all have something we want to do, but we just need to take further in that. So we go to God in prayer. Dear most gracious God and Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this moment to talk about faithfulness and service. Lord, we're all here and we all have a ministry and we all have something to do in this. And Lord, allow us by trusting in you and praying that you will allow us to move forward doing what you've called us to do. That we'll be faithful in our service, faithful in our contributions to the church, faithful in our community, and sharing your word. And that, Lord, we will even be more faithful and grateful for all the work that has been done. Lord, place among our hearts to know that you are a faithful God. And to be honest, you don't ask much of us. So, Lord, help us to fulfill our duties and our promises, and that we will further your word and your will be done. Lord, all these things in your name. Amen. Today we will have one adult Sabbath school class, which will be in the sanctuary. The revelations class will not take place today. If you have little ones, if you go to the left, it's the primary class, and to the right, it's children role. You guys have a happy Sabbath.
So folks will expire here. Stop for prayer. Eternal Lord, thank you for our time together today. We pray that your spirit would come and teach us. And Lord, empower us to be teachable. Thank you for hearing. We trust you and answer in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 7, verse number 14. If someone would be so kind, preferably with a microphone. Um, Revelation chapter 7, verse number 14. Um, again, preferably with a, uh, with a microphone. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. And um, this, the lessons uh, entitled uh, The Sealed People of God. Um, two things uh, before we get started. Uh, one, I want to take you back to a few weeks. I, when we first started this uh, quarter, I asked two things of the class. I asked, um, well, one thing I asked when we started and another thing I asked a few weeks back. When we started, we committed as a class to focus on Revelation 1.1. You all remember? And we said that no matter what we read in those 22 chapters, who was going to be the focus of our conversation? Because all 22 chapters is to more fully reveal Jesus, right? More specifically, though, a few weeks back when we were studying Revelations 4 and 5, I said something that seemed kind of like a bold statement, but I stand by it. And I said that those two chapters are often the least read. And if we don't spend time in chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation, we will get confused later in the book. Our conversation today is one of the earliest places we get confused if we don't spend time in Revelation 4 and 5, what do I mean? Well, when we ended chapter 6 last week, what was the setting in the book of Revelation? Somebody read for us Revelation 6 and verses 14, 15. Well, just really verses 15, 16, and 17 because we know islands were moved and mountains were moved and and and. What does Revelation 6, 15, and 16 say? Anyone with a microphone, please. And the king of the earth and the great men and the commanding commanders and, and the rich and the strong and every slave and every man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Follow us and hide us from the presence of him who sit on the thorn and from the wrath of the Lamb. And then a question is asked. Slois, what's that question asked in verse 17? You want me to read it? Please. Uh, For the great day of the wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Now, this is where we have to do a Bible study rule 101. Don't let the end of one chapter and the beginning of another keep us from getting some truth. So the question is asked, the great day of the wrath of God has come, and who's going to be able to stand? Because what we see here, most folk, what are they doing? They run in, and it's a strange kind of hiding. See, when, you, when you're really hiding, you know where you're going. These folk don't know how to hide because they talk into inanimate objects asking inanimate objects, fall on me. What do we call people that talk to inanimate objects? Yeah, so these people are delirious. That's like saying door, fall on me. Wall, fall on me. Mountain, fall on me. Rocks, I mean, we, you lost your mind. Yeah, they, these folks lost their mind. So who is able to abide and to stand in the great day of his wrath. Revelation 7. Somebody read for us under Sunday's lesson, the first three verses. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, 
so that no wind should blow on the earth or on the sea or any tree. Mm -hmm. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. Mm -hmm. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. Now, somebody explain to me what did Brother Kane just read. What's the setting? What do we have? What's described in the first three verses? What does the Bible say there exists? Let's start with verse 1. What does verse 1 describe? All right, so we got four angels standing on four corners of the earth. Our flat earth theorists love that verse, but don't, don't get twisted in the verbiage. Now, we know angels, according to Hebrews 1, we studied this the other week, what's their purpose? They're ministering spirits, and who are they sent to minister for and to? Those who are heirs of salvation. So even these four who are holding back the four winds. Now, according to verse number three, what were those four angels sent to do? So they were sent down here to do God's business. Now that's consistent, isn't it? When God destroyed Sodom, who did he send to do the tangible work? This ain't hard. According to Moses, what he told Pharaoh, who was going to show up? And the, if you didn't have that blood around your doorpost, you angels, see, see God, God uses angels. Yes, sir. It's to me, it's interesting that before God brings judgment, he personally gets involved in looking things over. But when, when Adam and Eve were asked to leave the garden, he personally came down and talked to them and told them the consequences of what they'd done. And the same thing when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he personally went down. In fact, he stopped by and talked to Abraham and said, what's your input on this? So God is a personal God that's involved with us, and before he brings judgments, he uh, visits them. Now let's talk about what he does before judgment comes. So there's a fifth angel, isn't there? And according to verse 2 and 3, what does he come down and tell the other four? Let's, let's read that. It said, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till who? Who does the sealing? What does the angel say? This is an interesting little tidbit, at least for me. The we. Who's the we? Angels. So you had four angels sitting, holding back the winds, and what were their purpose? According to verse 3. So if you tell, if, if you come to me and say, if I'm on a mission, and my wife says, look, don't hurt them folk, what is my mission? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm doing that to hurt the folk. So, I'm, so you got four angels who are going to hurt the earth. But then the, the fifth one comes and says, whoa, 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 don't do it. Don't do it till we, who's the we? So the same angels that were sent down to do the destruction, God has another job. And what is the job? Seal the trumpet. Now, I've been waiting all week to ask this question. What is the ceiling that these angels do? I knew there would be silence in heaven by a half hour. I'm sorry. Now, so, so how you got to you got we got to look at the Bible and see what the Bible says about that. Is that all right? All right. So I want to go to the book of Ephesians in the interest of time. And we're going to look at two texts. Uh, we're going to look at Ephesians one and we're going to read verses 13, 14. And then we're going to go to Ephesians chapter four and read verse 30. 
So again, Ephesians chapter 1, because I, I really want to know what the ceiling is because uh, there's this separation, right? Because if I'm sealing something, what two groups do I have? This ain't hard, is it? One group sealed, one group not, right? Now here's what's really interesting. Does the group seal themselves? Who does the sealing? And what are angels? So John, will you tell us one more time? Because you're the only one who want to quote Hebrews 1. There are ministering spirits sent to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. So who sent the ministering spirit? So an angel doesn't do anything from God, what he tells them. So who's responsible for the sealing? The key point is, folk don't seal themselves. Say it one more time. People do not seal themselves. God does the determination of the sealing. All right? Ephesians chapter 1. Somebody read verse 13 and 14, please. You also place your hope in Christ after hearing the word of truth, the good news of salvation. And God put his stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit. Oh, I like that. I like that. So what's, the, so what's the flow here? How does this happen? All right. So let's, let's read this verse. Mm -hmm. You also place your hope in Christ after hearing the word of truth. All right. So that's the way the gospel works, right? Mm -hmm. You hear the gospel. Jesus saved. You put your hope in Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Then what happens? How does this work? That's the good news of salvation. Uh -huh. God puts his stamp of ownership on you. Oh. By giving you the Holy Spirit. So when do I get stamped? Yes, ma'am. Use that mic for I it. think when, when we when we think about a seal, it, it uh, I was thinking about like the kings and different people have their seals. What they actually were transferring, it was an image that the person had. Mm. That's how they recognized the seal. It was it, it was like the kings or Hesiodus or whoever it was. Like there was they're, an they're image, and I think that this is, is to me as I study this that the seal is that the Holy Spirit creates with us the image of God within us. So, so let's. Let, I want to read a text, and then I want to come back to your point. I was going to say, to, um, along oh, with, please. Uh, with Joan, um, it's like with the Greek. Um, fraternities, they put seals on people and oh, you can random. distinguish, yes. Oh, oh, okay. So that's the Holy Spirit is God's seal. Okay, okay. So wait, 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 wait. Now because if we go down that path, I'm real curious what gets branded. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Anybody? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So, Brother Cain, you read something here. We are sealed until when? The day of redemption. When's the day of redemption? The second, the second coming. coming. Oh, so that's the scene we read at the end of chapter 6, first part of chapter 7. Now, uh, Sister White mentioned this cult concept of, 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 when we, of, of branding or putting a stamp of approval. What does the Bible say the Holy Ghost does? Anybody? The Holy Spirit is the one that goes up to Jesus with our prayers because we can't talk in the way that he can understand us. So he interprets for us and lets Jesus know what we're saying. All right, so I concur. Scripture says we don't know what we ought to pray, but with murmurings and groanings that human mind or human mouth can't say, okay, I got you. And what else does the Bible he say? He also leads us to what God wants us to do. He does us what the Lord wants. So John 14, he leads us to all truth. Whatsoever Jesus taught, what else does the Spirit of God do? He, he, so, so, the, so the Bible explicitly defines truth two places. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So he leads us to Jesus. And John 17, 17, Jesus praying to the Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So he leads us to the word. Brother Roy, preferably with a microphone. Anybody in the back have a mic? Yes, sir. He convict, convicts us of sin and lead us to repentance. See, if our knuckleheads didn't have somebody to instigate that, 
of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, right? Can we take two minutes and go through this? Because this is crucial. Jesus says he convicts us of sin because it ain't natural for us to believe on him. He convicts us of righteousness because Jesus says, I'm going to the Father. I won't be around here walking no more. There will be no right example. And he convicts us of judgment, and I love this one for the young folk. Because if we look at the world, what does the world, who does the world tell us is running stuff down here? Satan. Satan. John 16 says he convicts us of judgment because we need to know the prince of this world, he's already judged. See, that's what the Holy Ghost does. Now, Elder Hobbs, I've been around a minute. You want a few folk new when I start hanging out with you folk. And I heard some interesting theology on this seal thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, some folk told me that the seal of God was being able to count the seven. Yeah, I've heard that. That is about a day. Yes, sir. I remember uh, back in the late 70s and 80s reading mm -hmm. some of the Hal Lindsey stuff, and they were talking the seal was a physical mark. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and there's all kinds of things that people have said that the seal of the beast and the seal of God are, mm -hmm. but none of them are scriptural. So, so let, let's, let me ask a question um, before we jump into uh, Tuesdays. Anybody recall what the new covenant is? Anybody recall? He gives his law to our hearts. In our hearts. So God's going to take his law and write it in our hearts and our minds, right? How does he do that? He gives us a new heart. But how does he do that? What's the pen that he uses? How, so when God writes his law, what does he use? When God wrote his law on them tables of stone, what did he use? His finger. His finger. The gospel writer tells us the finger of God is also, I heard somebody say it loud with no truth. His spirit. So God's writing utensil is his spirit. Now here's what's fascinating. What did Jesus call the spirit of God on multiple occasions? A comforter. What? A comforter. Now here is what's fascinating. If the saints are going to be sealed or marked with the comforter, why is it when we start talking about this, we ain't too comforted? Yes, ma'am. Microphone, please. Constant sealing, it shows ownership. And you can take it a little further. You, for those who have animals that live on the farm, you know, a lot of times they put that, um, what they call it, the stamp on them, the seal. Yeah. It's ownership. A brand. A brand, yeah. Now, y'all look at me a little funny when I say we aren't comforted. So, so let's read the next few verses, which some might argue, are the most controversial in this movement. Y'all ready? Tuesday's lesson. Somebody pick up Revelation chapter 7, verses 4 through 8. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. From the tribe wait, 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 I'm going to cut you off, because I, I want you to read, though. I want you to read. All right, read that one more time for us, because I'll make sure we heard you clearly. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. All right, so then it goes to so many from each tribe. Everybody tracking? Now, this, he says, this, this is what John says. Now, pick up around verse 9, uh, Brother King. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. Now, I want to I go back to Revelation 1, because there's some imagery in the Bible that I think may, may, may work with us. You all remember, John said he was, where was John when, when something started happening? Where was he? On the Isle of Patmos, right? And what, what human sense, S-E-N-S-E, -E, did he first describe? 
What did John say? Do we need to turn over? John chapter number 1, verse number 10. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. So John heard, right? And then he turns around and who does he see? Now, if we don't get this, we need to go back a few weeks. John's in the spirit on the Lord's day on the Isles of Patmos, and he heard this voice, and then he turns around, and who does he see? He saw Jesus. Everybody tracking. Now, here's what's interesting. Did you all hear what Brother Cain read to us over in Revelation 7 about the 144,000? You want to read it one more time for us, Brother Cain? Please read verse number 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So uh, with the 144,000, what does John say about them? That there are multitudes that no one can count. Don't want to come there. I want to know what the first thing John says about the 144,000. They were sealed. That's not the first thing he said. That's not the first thing he said. What's the first thing he said? I heard. I heard. I heard. See, he didn't say he counted them. He said he heard. And then when he heard it, just like he did in Revelation 1, he heard the voice of many waters and he turned and looked. He heard the 144,000, but when he turned and looked, how many did he see? Yeah, that's a slight point, but it's very, very crucial and most important. Couldn't count them. See, so now that you can't count them, I ain't worried about the number. Because I don't worry about stuff I can't count. You know, it's like when I was a kid, we used to be riding. And I, Sister Lewis, you, you, you all, we'd be riding, and my dad had this little game he liked to play. You know, we always be counting stuff, right? How many cows, you know? You know, I keep kids occupied. Now they got pads and games, kind of keep them hushed. I remember we rode about by a, a grave site. My dad said, how many dead folk out there? And I went, he says, all of them, son, all of them dead. All of them <laughs> Doesn't matter. He heard 144,000. Why are we all into that number? No. He said, that's what I heard. But when I turned and looked, it was so many I couldn't count. So it's okay. He said, well, I'm part of 144. Don't matter to me. You can be because you couldn't count them. So, so Lois. Is the one See, I look for consistency in Scripture. I find in Revelation, John consistently says, I heard something, then I turned and I saw it. That's why I went to Revelation 1 first. So he says, I heard the 144,000, then I turned and looked. Boom, I couldn't count them all. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, you, your arithmetic is right on. Only thing about it, see, the seal is what allows folk to have a place in the kingdom. And a number won't get me in the kingdom. Um, but a savior will. And so the seal of God has to be tied to the savior. And what Jesus was very explicit about was that his spirit was going to be the vehicle that brings sinners to a saving knowledge of Christ. Actually, it's real interesting. He said he wouldn't even talk of himself. He would only talk about me, talk about Jesus. So this number, one could argue, is symbolic in scope. I really, it doesn't bother me whether you want to be literal or not. All I know is he didn't see that number, he heard it. When he looked and saw, he couldn't put no number on it, so I'm good. Now, I got a question. Remember I told you all the other week, remember I said the most underread verses in Scripture in the book of Revelation is chapters 4 and 5. And when you don't spend enough time in 4 and 5, you get real confused throughout the rest of the book. Why is it that we are fixated with 144,000?
because when you look at it without study and you say, oh man, only 144,000, I guess I'm out. <laughs> all right, all right, wait, 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 wait. So, so, so let's say, let's say we get clarity on that from hearing and seeing. Why then do we still have issue with the 144,000? Why are we fixated on that? What, what about that intrigues us? Oh, oh, microphone, please. Constantly in the Bible, 12 and 7 are uh, holy numbers, 12 mm -hmm. are referred to the tribe of Israel, 12 apostles, 12, uh, 12 uh, brother, uh, sons of uh, Jacob. Mm -hmm. It's a consistent number that falls in the Bible. Sis consistent number. Yes, ma'am. Because people are still trying to work to get salvation. So explain. Help me understand. That means... 144,000, then I got to be a part of that. It's something I got to do to be a part of that 144,000. What about that? Why? Why do why we want to be a part of them? Because we want to go to heaven. We want to be saved. Wait, you know. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Wait, wait now. Wait a minute. See, this is, see, see, God inspired John to write this book in a particular way. Last week, we took a pause during the seals, S-E-A-L's, and we were shown some folk around the throne of God. Anybody remember who they were? Who were they? Elders. There were elders, but they were martyrs, martyrs. right? And what state were they in? They were underneath and they were crying out, what day, Lord, how long? All right, so, so, so let, me, let me ask that one more time. If you martyred, what state are you in? You're dead. dead. You're dead. Okay, I'm just trying to figure this out. All right. So these dead folk wanted some vindication. And what did God give them, then tell them? He gives them a robe of white and tells them to be patient and wait a little longer. And what's going to happen? Then they'll be vindicated. Wait, 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 wait. They don't know the sleep. That's right. To join them. Oh, wait, wait, wait. So, so it's going to be some other folk to join them. So if you join a dead person, what must happen to you? Yeah. You die. You're going to die too, all right? <laughs> But everybody that died in the Lord, what did God give them? A robe of white. A robe of white. The 144,000, what color was their robe? White. Why do you care as long as you get a white robe? Amen. <laughs> oh, I got to be, no, just give me the robe. I, if I'm asleep, actually, I might choose the sleeping option. <laughs> sleeping versus being on earth when all that foolish is going, I think sleeping sounds pretty decent. By the way, I don't get caught. Well, Brother Roy, why well, make a statement? Microphone, please. Brother Roy. <laughs> and we, all right, cool. So, so that, that was my point. I, that's why we're getting that, because you, you just identified that you you sealed with the spirit, right? Yes, sir. So that means that the, the 144,000 has the spirit of God, right? You know how I said 12,000 from each tribe. Right. But then if you see a great multitude in heaven, that means that that same seal that the 144,000 have, they have to have. So it's really no different between 144,000 and the people, the great multitude. So why would the why would he distinguish? Maybe the 144,000 may have a specific role to play in the great multitude being there. To so so be here, there. no, 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 no. You hitting, you hitting, you hitting the nail. Can, can, can the teacher have a little fun this morning? Right. Y'all gonna be all right? Y'all gonna let me? Okay. When will we begin to pray the way Jesus asked us to? Our Father, which art in heaven. That next part. I know it don't come out the throat easy. Be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. We say that part, but that next part. Thy will be done. Let your will be done. Amen. Where? On earth, on earth as it is as in, in heaven. heaven. See, when it comes to these last days, instead of vying for being in a group, why don't we just ask God to let his will be done? Now, you know we have some scriptural precedents in this space when his will ain't done. All right? Y'all want to do the positive or the negative first? Do the negative first. Okay. <laughs> Where is it? Prophet Isaiah. Come on in. King Hezekiah. 
you get your house in order. God said your days are up. If Hezekiah allows that to happen, who is never born? Manasseh, who caused Israel to sin more than the heathen nations God drove out. Who else is never born? Ammon. See, you got to watch telling God what you want. Because sometimes he gives it to you. Israel, we want a king. No, let your will be done. Lord, if you want me living, I'm cool. If you want me to sleep, I'm cool. You know where I need to be. Now, can we do the positive? <sighs> Smack that rock. Uh, Moses, come on up here. Let me show you something. See all this land? Yes, Father, you ain't going. Now, what's really intriguing about Moses' ministry from that time forward, it's like he became more faithful. I'm blown away at that part of the book of Numbers. It's like from the time God tells him he can't go, he submits more fully. Because when you submit to God and he tells you you can't go, and you, you all do know something happens to Moses that's recorded nowhere else in the Bible. What happens to Moses? Ah, before all of that, before all of that, I know y'all read that story over in the gospel. He was translated, it tells you, Jude. Before that, what, does, what happens to Moses that I, I can't find anywhere else in the Bible? He sees the promised land, but what else happened? He is the only person I've read in the scripture where God actually conducted his funeral. That ain't too shabby. <laughs> and the Bible says they tried to find his grave. See, if they frustrated you enough to strike that rock, you might not want to be here too long because they might frustrate you enough for you to do some other stuff. No, Lord, you want me to go on? Yes, thank you, Master. <laughs> Thy will be done. So don't get caught up in telling God which one you want to be in. Uh -uh. Lord, let your will be done. You want me to sleep? Let me sleep. If you want me around, let me. all I want is that robe, Master. Make sense? Yes, sir. Need a microphone, please. I think Paul had a great understanding of that when he says, you know, for to be alive, to be dead, it's, it's really no difference with me as long as I am with the Master. Can you Bible read in SDA's finish a verse? Blessed are they that See, y'all been, I know y'all read Revelation 14 and you get caught up in them three angels. Mm -mm. Go to Revelation 14 and somebody read for us verse 13. Don't let them angels get you fixated. They, they did what they had to do, but 13 is some real juice when it comes to the conversation. Anybody with a microphone. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors where their deeds follow with them. Now, Brother Cain, if you read that, you got to read it in character. Because there are three folk there. See, remember, John was told to write whatever he saw and heard, right? So John is sitting there, and he hears this voice from heaven that says, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. And it's like the Spirit of God gets so wound up, he says, Yeah! cease from their labor and their works do follow them so whether I'm living and a part of that crew or I'm dead and sleeping I'm getting my robe so it's all good now let's talk about these folk under Wednesday's lesson um Let's look at some of their characteristics. Now, in Revelation 14, this 144,000 are mentioned. Somebody give us verse 1, please. Preferably with a microphone. 
And I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, mm -hmm. having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. Mm -hmm. Oh, continue, please. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud, loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. Mm -hmm. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one can learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. Wait, let's stop there. So wh wh what do we know about this 144,000? What does the scripture say about them? So they have a song, whatever this song was, they're the only ones that can learn it, right? And back to Sister White's point, when we read that, how do we feel about not being a part of that group? Wait, 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 no, 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 I'm going to stay, well, stay, I want to stay on this, I want to stay on this point. Because see, we, we don't talk about this, we, we whisper it, we don't talk about it. When we find out that the 144,000 has a song that can't nobody sing with them, how do we, everybody in here sometimes, except I, I say myself, I don't have no problem with this because I can't sing. I mean, if you, I'm just, I'm just saying, y'all never see me up front. Uh, even him time, my wife ribbing me, uh-uh, uh-uh, hum, hum. So, so you know, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. But when we hear about, I know I got this pitch thing, I, I hear it don't come out the way I want it to come out. But when we hear that there's some folk that learn a song that nobody can sing but them, what challenges do we have about not being a part? Well, and see, uh, we all want to be part of an elite group, okay? You know why I love I you? Because you're just going to tell the truth. That's, <laughs> see, see, we think, see, that's why I love you. We think that there's something elitist about being a part of the 144,000. Uh, yeah, and if, and if you, you feel like, you, you gotta think, hmm, only they can sing the song, and they're singing the song in the presence of the king. Yeah. I can't sing, I can sing, but I don't know the song, yeah. and I can't sing it. So I'm gonna be left out. So I'm gonna say, hey, what about me? Wait, 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 wait. Let's, let's, let's tie some scripture together. Because what do we think that they will be in the kingdom? We don't say it, but what do we think they're going to be? We think they're going to be a special, get some special rewards. They're going to be out. greater, right? They're going to be greater than me. Right. Now, Jesus then told us that's the way the Gentile greatness works. Now, I t uh, so, so, Brother came before you speak, we've got to go back to Revelation 4 and 5. See, this is why you got, we're not going to read it because we ain't got time. We read that three weeks ago. But you've got to go back to Revelation 4 and 5 because that gives you insight. It says... When the lamb shows up to open up the seals, what does everybody do with their crown? Cast him. He is the object. Or may I quote the prophet? He is the desire of all nations. Nobody caring about singing no song? No, not when Jesus is there. Oh, I'm in this choir. No, no, no. Jesus is there. He's all that matters. I hear people always talk about what they're going to do when they get to heaven. Newsflash. You have no idea what you're going to do. I, I think we're, we lose sight of the fact that although 144,000 are mentioned, there's also a line that says many multitudes, which tells me it's beyond the 144,000 that are going to be sharing in the reward. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Brother Kane, I, I, I didn't give you that, your turn. That, that was my thought. When this is the second time we've had that number, 144,000. And we, there are many who believe that is a special, inclusive number and only 144,000. We need to go back to 7-9. No, 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 no. Can we go forward? Well, I would, where is it? And Please, 7-9. A seven, nine. great nine? multitude. That's what, it, it's not, he's seeing a great multitude, not 144,000 in the context is sim a symbolic number. What is there? As a great multitude who are sealed. Wait, 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 wait. I got to figure out who these folk were. And then I'm going to go to Sister Joe. I got to figure out who these folk were. I just want to read one phrase out of chapter 14, verse number 4. All right? 
Somebody read verse number four. These, this 144,000. Well, no, we can go to verse three. This 144,000. How does verse three read? Verse three of Revelation 14. How does it end? Purchased from the earth. These folk from 144, they've been redeemed for the earth. What do you call a person that's redeemed from the earth? See, I know y'all, y'all, I have a tendency to accentuate the negative. What is a person that's redeemed, anybody that needs redeeming, what are they? Sinners. Sinners. Okay, okay, so these 144,000 sinners redeemed, who, who fights over being a sinner? Oh, I want to be a, I'm going to be a sinner. No, no, no. The only reason we're there is because we've been redeemed. Ain't nothing. Th- so they know some words that, by the way, they aren't the only ones with a unique song. So let's get some clarity. Everybody up in here got a song that nobody can sing but you. I know mine unique because ain't nobody in the earth been too twisty like I'm twisty. But Jesus has saved me from it. Oh, I can tell you some things and sing a song that you don't quite know the lyrics to. But I do. So don't get caught up in this elitist mindset. Because the only one that's going to matter in the kingdom is Jesus. By the way, let me ask you a question. Uh, uh, may I pick on me? You can mark this down. What's the date? Uh, ninth, ninth of February. If Jesus ain't in heaven, I don't want to go. I'm just talking about me. Because I got proof what happens when folk don't submit even in heaven. He's the only reason to go. He's the only reason to be there. He's the only reason there's going to be some peace. He, it starts with him. It ends with him. And it's in him in the middle. Because Revelation 1.1 says this whole 22 chapters is the revelation of. It's all about him. Not the 140. They they bid actors. By the way, they're so happy. Guess who they're singing around? Wait, wait, wait. Let's, Let's read. Let's read. They are so happy. What do these 144,000 people do? Go back to Revelation 7. Brother Cain was taking us there. Let me show you, me show you what kind of folk these are. Uh, verse 9. Yes, verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lord, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. So what do they talk about? Next verse. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Wait, wait, wait. So they so special, but what's on their mouth and on their tongue? Praising God. Oh, Jesus, thank you. And the scripture says they become, I love this. Y'all ever seen a little cartoon with the big dog Butch and the little dog Fido? You know, if, you know hey, Butch, what are we going to do today, Butch? Y- y'all remember that? Scripture says that there's 144,000. Everywhere Jesus go, they follow. Well, Jesus, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Where's the elitism is my point. Well, the elitism in the fact that when when Jesus told John to be writing about this, uh, he talked about the martyrs, okay? Um, I think it takes a lot to be a martyr. I'm not so sure I want to be one. That might put me in an elitist group because... (sighs) of my belief and faith in Jesus, I made a decision to give up my life in some situation. Okay, it's not an easy thing to do to say, yeah, I believe in Jesus with a guy standing behind you with a knife ready to slit your throat. So that part of the 144 that are martyrs, that is an elite group. May, may May I add some scriptural context? Sure. Why do we glorify death? Jesus doesn't. Oh, I'm going to die for the Lord. Uh, I ain't found nobody up in the Bible that was skinning and grinning about going to die for the Lord. Actually, my Bible tells me that when King Nebuchadnezzar made the decree that all of those folk, those wise men of Babylon are going to die. My Bible says Daniel went to his three comrades and said, man, we need to pray. Because why? We don't want to die. They weren't looking for no divine inspiration. They didn't want to die. You think John the Baptist wanted to die? What are we 
get this glorifying death. That's a strange thing to God. Our prayer should be, Lord, if it's your will, I will give up my life for you. If it's not, I'm good too. It's got to be God's will. Brother Kay. I was going to mention, oh, the, uh, I think the three Hebrew boys. Yes. They said, God has the power to save him. Uh-huh. But if he chooses not to, he is still God. Now, that brings us, we got five minutes. I guess it'll have to be our final. Oh, please, let me get your mic. You, you called it an elite group, and I was thinking it's something like people in the military or people, citizens of the United States do something. They receive the Medal of Honor. And it's a very elite group. And the reason they receive it is because of what they have done. <coughs> Excuse me, in the 144,000 here, it's what they have done that, that qualifies them. May, 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 I, may I, with that example? One of my closest friends has, make sure I'm right, Congressional Medal? Is that right? No, I got brother-in-law Purple Heart, and I got a, another friend with Congressional Medal on. All right, so my friend with Congressional Medal, he got shot down from an airplane, and my brother-in-law had an M50, and I've had extensive conversations both of them. You know what they felt while they were earning them medals? They were scared to death. That spirit of God give you that analogy. You know what these folk going through that's going to be thinking? God, you've got to help us. Brother Roy, you got a mic? Yeah. Ruby. So when it comes to the 144,000 as an elite group, I wouldn't say elite in that sense because, look, when you have. No, I said we think it's an elitist. It's not scriptural. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so in that sense, like, you, it's the same way you look at the 12 disciples. That through the book of Acts, you see the 12 disciples, 12 disciples, 12 disciples. But at the end of the day, it's thousands of disciples that's, 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 that's out and being brought into the church. So it wasn't that the 12 disciples was better than they, but they had a specific role and a specific job in the carrying the gospel. Wait, but wait, wait. Go let's, let's talk about this. Go ahead. Let's talk about this. Three minutes. Your example. Go ahead. Um, the church started to grow. Brother Roy took us here. Church started to grow, and Hebrew women, Greek women, start having some issues, right? So then what did they go to try to find to help solve that problem, the early church? Yeah, we got some brothers filled with the Holy Ghost, wisdom, and what were, their, what was, what were they called to do? Yes, wait on some tables. See, Brother Roy, this is what change me, read my Bible. Well, one of them table waiters, Philip, intrigues me. Because the table waiter went to a city and preached, so the whole city accepted the Lord. Table waiter. Actually, the apostles didn't show up until after he had done the work. Table waiter. Table waiter was just Walking down the road one day, and he sees this guy in a chariot. Jumps in the chariot, has a one-on-one -on -one Bible study. It wasn't thousands like Peter. But the scripture says when he finished, the guy looked up. Where was Philip? I hadn't figured out how that happened yet, but if being a table waiter is the qualifications you need, full of the Holy Ghost, I'm down with that. See, we, we've gotten this hierarchical concept when it comes to ministry, when it comes to the kingdom, when it comes to all of this, and it's not scriptural. Brother Kay. Who are distinguished that they are saved, they are sealed. But it's just like the seal. What is the seal? So, the so Bible is scriptural. It's, 
But people got hung up on what the seal is. They think of a physical. Wait, 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 wait. No, let's talk about it. What did we say the seal was? No, that's not true. What did the scripture say the seal of God was? Holy Spirit. Okay. What did Luke tell us? It says, if your son asked for some bread, would you give him a stone? If he asked for a fish, will you give him a snake? God says, well, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, then I know how to give the Holy Ghost to who? Everybody. Everybody who asks. So who can be sealed? Everybody. Anybody and everybody. Yeah. Got to say something for 34 seconds. We make those claims, uh, Brother Kane, because we think we got heaven figured out. I would argue scripturally, we don't have a clue what heaven's going to be like. Can I give you a small example? My Bible tells me in two places, won't be no more pain. Nobody else in this room knows what that is like. Actually, those of you who were pain-free before you set your rump in the chair, you've shifted your rump three or four times because if you sit long enough in the same spot, your rump starts to hurt and you shift. You have no idea, you and I, what pain not having it is like. We have no idea, no sorrow. No more crying. So we need to be real careful about what we're going to do. We're going to be so surprised. The more I read my Bible, the more I think we're just going to be like. Except when it comes to Jesus. When it comes to him, oh, I can tell you what you're going to do. You're going to take them crowns off, slide them at his feet, and say, Jesus, you the man. I guarantee that. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the precious promises that you've given us. Lord, as the world winds down and comes to an end, surely your Bible has told us about a time of trouble that has never been on this earth. But it's in the midst of that time, Lord God, that we know we have those ministering spirits sent to minister those who are heirs of salvation and inheriting eternal life. We know, Lord God, that you never leave your folk stranded. Contrary to popular opinion, in that very time, your saints will have your spirit sealed in their foreheads, written in their hearts and minds. Thank you for it, Lord God. Bless the remainder of our worship experience today. Allow it to be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. Happy Sabbath to everybody. It's time to have our special children's worship, and we invite the children in the congregation to go to the back and pick up the baskets. And as we sing this song, we invite them to come forward and take up a special offering that we use to help in educating our young people of this church. The first song that we're going to sing is Jesus Loves Even Me. And if you'll join in and sing with us. children's story. Good morning. How are you? Good? 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 You see that? In your eyes, is that pretty? No, that's not really pretty. What makes pretty? Well, let's not talk about this type thing right now. Yeah? Well, <laughs> I want you to do me a favor. Start unwinding that. Would you do that? There's the start of it right there. And just start unwinding that a little bit. And if you can't do it, hand it to someone. Let them do a little bit. Don't unwind it all the way. Let's talk about people. You're doing good. You're doing good. Let's talk about people. What makes people pretty? I see pretty hair 
on two young ladies right here. Beautiful hair. And I see a well-dressed young man right here. And then I see two more beautiful young ladies right here. Does that make total beauty? Is that how we describe beauty? Is it? Well, one, let me, give you, let me give you a little story here about a cat I had. I had a cat was named Jamie. It was a Siamese cat. Have you ever seen a Siamese cat? Gorgeous cat. It is kind of a brownish and tan with blue eyes. And I'm not getting your attention because of that. Let me have that. We're going to, it's a rock, you're right, it's a rock. I had this cat, and the cat was beautiful. Blue eyes, brown, just pretty cat as you looked at it. But the cat had a flaw. When we had company come over, it would get behind the couch, and it would start scratching, and the people that were sitting on the couch were wondering what that was. So they would look in back of the couch, and guess what the cat would do? It would jump up and smack them right in the face. Oh, man, just scared them to death. Well, that didn't make that cat lovely, did it? Nobody wanted to be around that cat because that cat was mean. Oh, so mean. But I also had, can I tell you a story about a dog? I had a dog that didn't look too good at all. He just was one of those dogs that had about 50,000 mixtures in him. All kinds of different dogs in that dog. <laughs> just not a pretty dog. Just didn't, you looked at the face and it wasn't a pretty face. And you, you looked at the hair and the hair was kind of scraggly and it just, wasn't a, a pretty dog at all. But you know what made that dog special? It would come up to you, and it loved you. It would rub up against you. It would look up into your face. And it, at that time, even though it didn't have a pretty face, he was lovable. And you would reach down, and you would pet him, and he just loved to be pet, petted so much. And he would give love and he would accept love. Now, what makes beauty? Anybody have an idea now? Love. That is absolutely correct. Love. Now, we're going to unwrap this it's a rock, but it's a special rock. I like to collect rocks. And what would you, what kind of a rock would you collect if you were walking around? What kind of rock? White rocks. White rocks. Black rocks and brown rocks and little white. All kinds of rocks then, wouldn't you? Brown rocks. Brown rocks, yeah. Well, this is kind of a brown rock. Let's open it up. Uh, and see how special this rock is. Because to the eye, it's not going to be a real pretty rock. This is going to be like a little small rock. I did a good job on my collection. Do you see it? Well, it's special. Now, this is a special rock. This, is, this, this rock is very special. You know what it's called? I found this rock. volcano. A volcano spit it out. It kind of went and these geodes fall everywhere. Now to look at them Yeah. 
a Billy Rock. Maybe it must be a Pandalga Rock. Open it, Dave. Open it. You have to open it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's like golden. Is that liquid? I keep it. Let's bow our heads. Loving Father in heaven, we love you so much. We want you to be in our hearts. We want you to shine out where we will be a light for other people. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can go back to your seats now. Thank you, Bernie. That's a wonderful illustration. Amen. We're beautiful on the outside, but also we're more beautiful on the inside because God looks on the inside. That's where he wants his character to be found. Our pastor is not with us today. He is in Clanton, but you're here. Praise the Lord. And Stan Hobbs is going to be speaking for us today and with us today. And Stan, may God's spirit bless you as you impart to us. Welcome, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Praise God. Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord on this wonderful day? Amen. Praise the Lord. Just a quick um, announcement or two. If you're visiting with us today for the first or the second time, please stop by across the way and share a meal with us. We call it, we call it Visitor's Meal. And if you're a member and you're going to stay by, please bring something with you so that we can all uh, enjoy the meal together and feed those who are going to stay by. Um, the other thing simply I want to quickly remind us is Islam and Christianity. While we're about a month away, we need to be identifying friends and family members that we can invite to this wonderful, amazing seminar. Islam is on everybody's mind today. You hear it in the news, right? But it's a spiritual message behind that that we need to know about as it relates to Christianity because God is calling. He's got folk in every religion. And so... Our friends and neighbors need to know about that. So please, I'll be thinking about who you can invite. Amen? Let's do that. At this time, we're going to ask our team to, to lead us into our Remember the Sabbath song. And it's not so much about the Sabbath. It is the creator of the Sabbath. Amen? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's stand together.
bless us in so many ways and sometimes we just take those blessings for granted help us to realize that you love us in a unique and special way that each one of us are important to you we thank you for the sabbath that reminds us that you created us and we ask and covet your presence with us here today in jesus name amen A few years ago, when I was in um, when I was in high school, I went on a mission trip, and uh, actually I was in college. Went on a mission trip to Mexico, and we went down there to with our band, our orchestra, to play music and things. And when they have trips like this, they would organize places for us to stay. Um, it's m much more cost friendly to stay in a church member's house, and so we would stay. We divide the whole group un into like small groups of two or three. And I remember my friend and I, we stayed at this gentleman's house, and it was a very simple structure. Um, in fact, when we got inside, uh, the our rooms, our bedrooms that we were in, the wall was just he hung up a rope uh, from one side of the living room to the other, and he turned his living room into two bedrooms. So there's a sheet that separates the room. And he didn't do that for us. That's how his house was. That's how he lived. And so one of us stayed on one side of the sheet, and the other one stayed on the other side of the sheet, and that was how we lived. He left early for church the next Sabbath, but he woke us up and told us where we could find breakfast. And so when we finally got out of bed, you know, we're like 19, 20, uh, when we finally got out of bed, we went to where he said the food was, and us being, you know, young American kids, we're thinking, well, where's the food he was talking about? You know, we opened the fridge, and we, we saw, uh, you know, one or two things of yogurt that was expired. So we opened it up and said, should we, should we eat this? And we kind of tasted it and said, no, nah, we, we can't eat this. And, and we saw the bread, and most of the stuff that he had for us, we, we didn't eat it. We just said, no, nah, we, can't, we can't do this. This isn't right. And I remember we left kind of in awe and, and amazement because this, the guy was so happy to have us there. Like, he was just so happy to have us. He was there treating us to all of his stuff, and we felt kind of bad that we didn't really, like, uh, think the stuff that he had to service was, was of high quality. And, but these, he was just happy. I remember we, we went home thinking to ourselves, I mean, living in such poverty, um, such abstract conditions, abject conditions, it's like, how can these people be so happy? 
you know, after you're gone for a little while, you get home and it feels good to, to get back to your own bed, to take a shower with hot water, and, and to lay down in, in, in your own clean sheets. It just feels good to get back to what we consider normal. And normal for a lot of people around the world is maybe living in a hut, maybe a whole family, 10, 12 people living in a one-room house. It may be an entire family traveling to work on a motorcycle. You guys, if any of you guys have tra traveled to another country, I've seen whole families travel to work on a motorcycle. You don't see that here in America. You might see one person with a helmet or someone riding behind them. But normal to a lot of people um, is strange to some of us. Um, but how can these people be so happy? So happy. But this morning, our Sabbath school, I mean, our church budget offering is actually going to Adventist Television Ministries, world budget. And I'll tell you about it. W this Adventist Television Ministries, it includes Hope TV, Faith for Today, Breath of Life, It is Written, and many other programs. These ministries help spread the gospel all around the world, even to places where I went to visit. With these programs, we can reveal to people who the source of their happiness is. There's many people all around the world that don't even know. They're just happy, and they don't realize that it's God that makes them happy, even in their condition. With these television programs, we can reveal to them who the source of their joy is. So I'd like to ask the deacons to come forward, and we'll pray for our offerings this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being a God that provides for all of our needs. Uh, Lord, there's some who have more, some who have less, uh, but Lord, with you, uh, there's always joy. Lord, we want to be able to introduce you to many people here in the United States and all around the world uh, that haven't had a chance to meet you yet, and some of these programs will be the channel uh, that leads them to Christ. So Lord, we ask that you take these offerings that we have today, and we ask that you bless it and allow it to further your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our hymn of worship this morning is Soldiers of Christ Arise, so shall we arise and sing together.
soldiers of Christ arise. Please be seated. My older brother, he's passed now, and um, he was a Green Beret. And I know he fought in Vietnam. I always marveled at him, his desire to just follow wherever the country wanted him to go. I was never a soldier. And like you, many of you, you can't brag that you were soldiers. Many of you guys who have won the Armed Forces, Air Force, or wherever, our salute to you. But most of us here are not soldiers, have not fought in the Army, have not been on the battlefield. But we are called to be soldiers on a different battlefield, a different batter battlefield. And that is the battlefield that surrounds us every day. We're called to be soldiers for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And so when I'm looking at our meeting today, I'm looking at different people. Um, yesterday, Milton, you were there first thing in the morning at the Acts of Peace giveaway. Parking cars, huh? It's on the battlefield. Amen? And Tui, here you are. Yesterday, we passed out 200 brochures to, to the 200 cars that showed up yesterday, giving them information about the Sabbath and what the Sabbath's about. Soldiers on the battlefield, amen? And Gisela, I saw you yesterday bringing one of your neighbors for food, witnessing to her, just sharing with her on the battlefield. Folks, we're all soldiers, amen? Because it's God's army that we're a part of. We can't be called a soldier if we're not on the battlefield. We've got to find some place where God has called us to on his battlefield. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings, I see several of us here, prayer warriors on the prayer line, praying for our congregation, praying for our pastor, praying for our neighbors, praying for our church ministries. That's prayer ministry on the battlefield. This morning, I just want to encourage us, find out where God is calling you, but be on the battlefield for him, amen? Amen? We invite you this morning to, we invite you this morning to come forward if you want to share something, especially with the Lord. If you haven't made up your mind where you want to be on the battlefield, come and talk to him this morning. Or if you want to just praise him in a special way, we invite you to come on down. Now, dear Lord, as we pray. Let us kneel. Now, dear Lord, as we pray, take our hearts and minds far away from the press of the world all around to your throne where grace does abide. moments to silently talk to God in your hearts. Thank you, Father, for inviting us here this morning to worship you. Thank you for our Sabbath school class this morning, Father, where we are taught, that we were taught that the heavenly beings and those who will be in heaven will understand it's all about worship, worshiping you. And so, Father, here today we have come to worship you in spirit and in truth. For God seeks such those who want to worship him in spirit and in truth. 
Father, we thank you, Father, just for, for loving us the way you do, in spite of our weaknesses, in spite of our faults, in spite of our sins, in spite of our iniquities. You love us anyway. We thank you for your forgiveness, Father. We thank you for the love and the forgiveness that we find, the grace that we find through the person of Jesus Christ who makes it all possible, who embraced us with his life, his perfect life of righteousness. He gifts to us. And then he died the death that all of us deserve to die. So, Father, we praise your name this morning for your amazing love, for your amazing faithfulness. We look at the cross of Christ, O Lord, and we see ourselves. But we also see the hope that comes through his death. This morning, Father, we ask that you remember those who are struggling with chronic diseases. We pray for their healing. Those who have terminal diseases, we ask that you would be merciful, Father. We pray for many of our church members who are struggling with, with sicknesses. We ask that you... Comfort and strengthen and bring healing to their souls and their hearts. We think of those, Father, who have lost loved ones. We pray that you will comfort and strengthen them as well. Now, with the Lord, we ask that you would remember our speaker this day. He has prepared a sermon, Father, but we ask that you would speak to us through his heart and that we will leave this place not only blessed but transformed into your likeness. Thank you, the Lord, for hearing our prayer. And we ask that you be merciful and receive our prayers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just one second, let me wake this laptop up. There we go. Sounds good. Good morning. I tell you, I told my daughter this morning that I was speaking in Montgomery today, and I said, I think it's a little more stressful than usual because I'm speaking in front of relatives and colleagues and mentors and friends and you know it's a little different than speaking in Mobile or Huntsville or Birmingham or someplace like that because I don't know people as well but uh, I want to tell you that uh, a few months ago I was asked about preparing a sermon last time I was here was August of 2017 was the last time that I spoke and I talked about walking on Mercy Street I hope that's been an experience of yours. It's certainly one that I want every day. But a few months ago, I was asked about speaking for an education Sabbath, and I, I've kind of committed myself that when I speak for an education Sabbath, I want it to be more than that. I, I, want, I want there to be something for everybody, whether you're a grandparent, whether you're a person who has no kids, uh, regardless of your walk in life, I want there to be something for you. And that is my prayer today. I just want to say that as I begin, uh, as we share. I, I probably will put in a little plug for Adventist education at some point, boys. Uh, that's what I do. Uh, but I want to, to really inspire you. I want to encourage you today. I want to challenge you today uh, in your walk with Christ and in this battle that, that uh, um, Burnell was talking about just a moment ago. So if you would just join me in prayer one more time, uh, we'll, we'll uh, open the word and get started. Dear Father in heaven, I just ask that you will speak through me today, uh, you know, the burden that we have on our heart here, and we just pray, Lord, that you will bless and that your spirit will be here with us, because we know when you're here with us, our time is not spent in vain. We just pray that you will encourage us and inspire us today in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there was a Barna study 
Barna's a, uh, a survey group. They do a lot, of, a lot of work that's really interesting, especially in Christian circles. And there was one that came out this week, and I want to talk about it in a few minutes. But I want to reference one that came out last year uh, uh, to, as the baseline for what I want to talk about. You see my title in the bulletin, right? The Battle for Gen Z. Last year, Barna re released uh, the results of a fascinating survey that they did about Christianity and America's youngest generation, this generation called Gen Z. The conclusion of that study was that Christianity in the United States is waning. The rates of church attendance, religious affiliation, belief in God, prayer, Bible reading have all been dropping for decades. We've been hearing about that, right? But in this study, they determined that Americans are less Christian than ever. The religious identity of the nation is changing as a whole, and it's reflected in this younger generation more than anywhere. I did some research on this, and I found a lot of sources agree with Barna. Less than 70% of Americans now identify themselves as Christians. Okay, what were you saying, Burnell, about soldiers of Christ we need to arise? Less than 70% identify themselves as Christians. No major Christian tradition or denomination in the United States of America is actually growing. And a group so-called, they call them nuns, not N-U-N-S, but N-O-N-E-S, nuns. These are people who are atheist, agnostic, or believe, quote-unquote, nothing in particular. They now comprise one-fourth of the U.S. population. Enter Gen Z. Now, if you look at my slide up here, it should be up. It's up here, showing here, plugged in. That's okay. When they get it up, we'll be all right. I got, I got on this beautiful slide that I prepared, I have uh, all the generations listed, and Gen Z is the youngest. They were born 1999 to 2015. Now, I do a lot, of, a lot of reading as I travel, and I read a book recently called The Coddling of the American Mind. Fascinating book. And in that book, they call Gen Z, Gen I, and they date it 1995 rather than 1999. But it's basically the same generation. Why 1995? Because they came of age, is it there? Oh, okay, JCMI, yeah. The, uh, they came of age during the time that the iPhone was released. And so they've grown up as a connected generation. Now, I really need this next slide. They grew up connected. Uh, I have a slide that shows, I'll describe it for you. I have a slide that shows this little boy, and he has a book, and he's going to school on the first day, and his, and, and his mommy is saying, you read that. That's what you do with that. He doesn't even know what the book is because he's grown up with the iPads and things. In that study that was released this week, just a few uh, days ago, they determined that 19% of even three- and four-year-olds have a tablet. And 52% of three- and four-year-olds go online every week for an average of nine hours. That's the three- and four-year-olds. So if I were to tell you, let's take a look at the older generations of young people, it's, it's even greater, obviously. There are a lot of stats that we could throw out about Gen Z. Are we good now? Still not good. Okay, it's, it's, uh, it's actually not even broadcasting correctly. You know what's strange about technology? Is you guys probably have the best technology of any church that I've spoken in. Isn't that, isn't, that, isn't that the way the, the, the things go? It's probably the best technology of any church that I've made this presentation in in the last few months. And it's the only one that I've had technological issues in. So that's really funny. It's really funny. But anyway, uh, we're going to go ahead without it. We'll be all right. But I want, to, um, I want to talk about my favorite stat about Gen Z. I was talking to Todd Casey, our youth director, about uh, Gen Z. And he was filling my mind with all this stuff. And I said, Todd, stop. 
I have already researched this, and this sermon is too long as it is. I don't want anything else. He says, but you've got to know this one. And I said, okay, what is this one stat? And he said, did you know that they've, they've done this study, and Gen Z has an attention span of eight seconds. And a goldfish, a goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds. So I went home and I said to my son, Colton, who was born in 1999, so he's the oldest Gen Z, right? He was born in 1999, the oldest Gen Z. I said, hey, Colton, did you know that you have an Gen Z has an attention span of eight seconds and a goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds? And he said, wait, what? Did you get that? I, and I said, he said, Dad, you know I was just joking, right? I told him I was telling this at a church. And he says, Dad, I was just joking. And I said, I didn't, okay, but it did take me nine seconds to tell you that. So I'm not so sure. More than any generation before them, Gen Z does not assert religious identity. They are considered to be the first truly post-Christian generation in our nation's history. What does it mean to be post-Christian? For those of you who don't know what that term means, it means that in, the con in this context, they are a generation that is not merely a generation in which ag agnosticism or atheism is the prevailing fundamental belief, but beyond that, it is a generation living in a society that is rooted in a history and a culture of Christianity like ours. Only those religious beliefs have been either rejected or worse, they've been forgotten. That's Gen Z. And the stats bear this out. The percentage of Gen Z that identifies as atheist is double that of the U.S. population. Double. And this generation is joining the nuns like no other. Three out of four baby boomers are Protestant or Catholic Christians, while just 59% of 13 to 18-year-olds say that they are, quote, some kind of Christian. It's interesting to be some kind of Christian. What kind of Christian are you? Now, my next slide, if it was up there, has a stat about these nuns. There's another way of looking at this. I added all the non-Christians, the Muslim, the Hindu, all of those together, plus the agnostics, the atheists, and the nothing in particulars, and you can see that Gen Z has much less religious identity as a whole than any other generation. Why? They asked them in this survey, Barnum the most noted barrier to belief is the struggle to find a compelling argument for the existence of both evil and a good and loving God. You hear that? That's called theodicy. Boomers, boomers like me, we somehow managed to overcome that barrier. Only 18% of boomers who do not identify as Christians say that that's a barrier to their belief. Yet it is the primary barrier for millennials, and for Gen Z. They just can't reconcile that. Simple childlike faith that the Bible talks about isn't really enough for millennials and Gen Zers. When I grew up, they said, God said it, and I believe it, and that's good enough for me. That's what we sang about, right? But nearly half of this generation say they need factual evidence to support their beliefs which explains their uneasiness with the relationship between science and the Bible compared to other generations. Now, what is all in, why is all this so interesting to me? I'll just interject that. Because these are our students in our schools right now. Uh, in every school I have, that's, that's who our students are. They're Gen Z. And so I want our teachers to think about some of these things. Are you thinking about this in a new way with the students that you have? They're not like the students that you had before. These generations are embracing relativism like never before. And as a result, uh, this, this is just shocking to me. This is a shocking statement. More than half of all Americans now agree with this statement. Many religions can lead to eternal life. There is no one true religion, period. More than half of all Americans. i I, I got to interject here that... Didn't Jesus kind of counteract that a little bit <laughs> in his teachings? I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
he said. He didn't say, I can show you the way or I can take you this way or I can show you which way to go. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Paul said, what did he say? There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved other than Jesus. And his disciple John, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. In our culture, to say that today is bigotry especially for Gen Z and millennials. Sad. Ellen White said, the position that it is of no consequence what men believe is one of Satan's most successful deceptions. She said that a long time ago, and it certainly is applying to our generation. Now more on this relativism. For Gen Z, this is, this is even more shocking than the previous statement. For Gen Z, what's true for someone else may not be true for me. And they are much less apt than older generations to agree that a person can be wrong about something they sincerely believe in. Can you be wrong about something you sincerely believe in? Not to Gen Z. For a considerable group of teens and younger, sincerely believing something makes it true. And just think about the logical conclusion of that Moral relativism, if you are living in a society that is based on legal uh, and moral values and the rule of law. Serious implications for our society. This relativism explains something that this new survey said this week. Half of all Christian millennials think that evangelism is wrong or immoral. That survey was released just this week, February 5. Think of the implications for that, for a church like ours, where when I walked into this morning, we were talking about being sealed, and we were talking about the third angel's message and all of these things that we see in Revelation. A unique message based on the Great Commission to spread the gospel to all the world so that Jesus can come back again. That's immoral now. Interestingly, Gen Z... They generally have a positive view of church, but as we noted earlier, few care to attend. Why is that? They ask that. Here's a list. I'm going to run through them real quick. The church seems to reject much of what science tells me about the world. The church is overprotective. The church is hypocritical. The church is not a safe place to express doubts. The church teaches things that are rather shallow. The church seems too much like an exclusive club. Only one in five Gen Z say that attending church is very important to them. One in five. So they ask that. Why? Because church is not relevant to me personally. I find God elsewhere. I can teach myself what I need to know. The rituals of the church are empty. I don't like the people who are in my church. Church is out of date. And get this. 46% of Gen Z who call themselves Christians, that is, they're not a nun or an atheist or one of that group, they call themselves Christians, they say, church is not relevant to me personally. That's almost half, and these are people who call themselves Christians. So here's Barna's conclusion. This is an indicator that at least some churches are not helping to facilitate teens' transformative connection to God. So I want to ask you today, can we reach Gen Z and reverse these trends? Can we reach a post-Christian generation for Christ? Today I want to talk about what you maybe personally can do to help win the battle for Gen Z. And I've broken it down, the strategy, into three parts. So I guess I'll go ahead and close this one. Get it out of my way. I've broken the strategy down into three parts. The church, and who is the church? It's everyone within the sound of my voice today. Parents, group two, parents, guardians, grandparents, aunts, uncles. Do we have any of those here today? Number three, I want to say at the end, I want to say something about schools, our schools that we operate. 
More on that later. And yes, I know your local school gets that too. So that's okay. But bear with me on that for a few minutes. First of all, the church. Maybe you saw an article in the Southern Tidings about that was based about a book called Growing Young. And that book is a strategy for reaching Gen Z for Christ. The author states, your church needs young people, and young people need your church. One without the other is incomplete. Do you believe that? Yet, as we have seen, young people are leaving the church and not getting much out of church if they actually come. To reverse this and grow young, churches need to try six things according to this article. Did any of you read that in Southern Tidings? It's a while back now. Here are the six things. I can't unpack all this today, but maybe it'll get you thinking. You can go back and do some research of your own and think, how could I do this? How could we as a church do this for the young people that we do have? And I'm sorry to those of you who are in Gen Z today. I'm talking about you, not to you. I'm accustomed to talking to Gen Z in my career. But today I'm kind of talking about me. But maybe there's something for you too. As you try to reach your fellow Christians who aren't believing the same way that you believe as you relate to young people that believe differently than you, that are in your same generation. But here they are, six things. Uh, I'm going to uh, just kind of throw them out there. Number one, unlock leadership. Instead of centralizing authority, empower others, especially young people. Amen. Number two, empathize. Empathize with today's young people. Instead of judging or criticizing, step into the shoes of this generation. And they spend chapters unpacking what that really looks like. Number three, take Jesus' message seriously. Instead of formulaic gospel claims, welcome young people into a Jesus-centered way of life. Boyd, you said it this morning. I mean, who, who is sealed? Those who have been redeemed. By who? At our outdoor school that we have out at Camp Alamisco uh, every April, we had a guy that come this year that talked about reptiles. And he's a reptile expert. And he brings all kinds of snakes and lizards and all kinds of stuff. And he talks to the kids, but every day he has worship time. And he kind of relates his worship to those type things. It's really cool. Kids love it. Fifth and sixth graders are the ones that come from all over the country. They love it. So by the time he leaves, they, they, they've really liked this guy. They've, they've gotten accustomed to listening to him, and he's built a relationship with them. And the last thing that he said today, I loved it, because he's, he's doing number three. He, he, he had a big poster, a big picture with Jesus in the center of it. And he had all the things written on this poster. And I had a picture of it for you on my slide. But he had this. Not, all, all these things connected to Jesus, and, and some of them you know, may not have been things that you, you, know, you, know, you know, like music and video and uh, games and ball and all these different things. None of the evil in, in and of itself. But he said, never let those things become the center of your life. Make Jesus the center of your life, and then all these things will be added unto you. It really was the message that he was trying to say. And I love that, because that's really where we need to reach our young people. Number four, fuel a welcoming, warm community. Instead of just focusing on cool worship programs, aim for warm peer and intergenerational relationships and friendships. Intergenerational friendships. Now that is huge for me personally as a kid and as a teen. The, 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 the friendships that I developed with generations that were outside myself, my my brother's sitting back here today, and he would remember a guy named Bill Barrett who, who did that for us at our, in our church and in our family. He was just a church member, but he reached out to us as little boys and built a relationship with us. That was really cool. And I tell you, uh, I think my parents were expert at this as I think about this. And I can tell you, you know, we lived in Peachtree City, Georgia for, for, for 10 years. There were a couple of individuals in that church that had a major impact on my daughter. Just major impact. And this wasn't just a casual, hey, how you doing? This was intervening in her life in meaningful ways to be a, a significant person in her life. So much so that, and I could go into that, I could preach a whole sermon on the impact they had on my daughter. But the thing about it is this. 
when it got time for her to get married in 2015, she was getting married in a small venue, and she had to narrow down the list of people that she could invite to that wedding. And I'm telling you, there were relatives and there were friends that she had known all her life that did not get to the wedding, but those two individuals did, even though they were older, because of the impact that they had. What, a, what an amazing impact they had, these intergenerational friendships. I, I, uh, she's a millennial, but I think that same strategy works for Gen Z. Number five, look for ways, people. That's why I'm saying I got something for everybody today. Older people in this church, look for ways, whether it's a grandkid or whoever it is, look for a way that you can reach out to these young people and be friends with them. Prioritize young people and families everywhere and in everything, number five. Now, that one's tough for churches. But this is what they write. Instead of giving lip service to how much young people matter, look for creative ways to tangibly support and resource and involve them in all facets of your congregation. It might mean giving up preferences or shifting what in the past might have been considered non-negotiable, but doing so benefits the whole church. As one pastor put it, Everybody rises when you focus on children and teens. Young people are like salt. When they are included, they make everything else taste better. Amen. Number six, this is the last one. Be the best neighbors. Instead of being so quick to merely condemn the world outside of the walls, enable young people to, and I love this phrase, neighbor well. Were you guys neighboring well yesterday out here in the parking lot? Like give young people opportunities to neighbor well so that they might witness and serve and reach those neighbors locally and globally. They're into that sort of thing. Okay, I want to transition to parents and grandparents. What, what could you do possibly to reach Gen Z maybe in a new and different way? Get this. Two out of three Gen Z parents attend religious services once per month. Okay, unpack that for a moment. Two out of three attend once a month. That's 12 times a year for 66%. That's all they do. Is that enough? Is that enough church attendance for them? It gets worse. The majority of the parents do not spend any time during a typical week discussing spiritual issues. Any. We only have a few minutes today, but parents, regardless of whether the stat applies to you or not, I want you to look at a familiar verse in a new way today. And I was going to put it up on the screen, but I want to unpack this verse with you a little bit, parents and grandparents. If, you'll, if you have your Bible, because I can't put it up, look in Deuteronomy. This is a text that you've heard many times. Look at Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9. And what I hope, if we unpack this verse just a little bit, maybe it'll give you something new in your toolbox to think about something in a different way. But if you'll turn to that, it's Moses speaking. And Moses, beginning on uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 6, he says, Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Now, I had a cool graph that showed all four of those, okay, that would, that would be up on the screen. Bind them as a sign on your hand, and fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now, it seems like to me that Moses is worried that society might one day only view God as like a little smaller part of the culture. Are, are we there yet as our, as our culture, Bernie? Have we reached that point that we, God's a little smaller part? The stats show that. So let's take a little closer look at what Moses said. If you, if, you if you just break down, he's got four quadrants, four times of the day. When you sit at home, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Pretty much covers it, doesn't it? Now, I read a book, one of the books that I've read in my driving is a book called Think Orange. And the guy that wrote it, his name is Reggie Joyner, and he observes that each time of the day here, each, each of those times represents a different style or approach to learning that you can employ with your kids. It's a chance for a parent to play 
multiple roles in their child's life because not all those four things are the same. Lying down isn't the same as eating. It's almost as if Moses had a degree in child development. Seriously, I mean, think about it. He, here he is. He's laying it out for us. So if you think about it, this is what Joyner suggests, and I think it's really cool. He says, here's the first one. When you sit, when you eat, that's your opportunity as a parent or a grandparent or a guardian, whatever it might be, to be a teacher for your child. Eating meals together is an optimal time to have a focused discussion, to establish values. Did you know that, st and, and again, we could unpack this for hours. We could have a whole series on this. But did you know that studies show that the more meals families eat together, just that simple thing, the more meals families eat together, the less likely that it is that, that child, and you would probably know this, Floyd, would ever take drugs or go to prison. Just that. Studies show that. It's, a, it's, a, it's real. It's amazing. Second thing he says, when you walk. Now today we might say when you ride, when you travel, when you move around, when you, uh, whatever it is that you're doing. This is your opportunity, Joyner advocates, to be a friend or a companion with your child. It can be the cultural mirror that they need as you enter into these discussions with them your chance to help them interpret life that they're experiencing. Now, today, and I can tell you this, I used to do this uh, with my, my children when I was in Atlanta. We had commutes every day back and forth to school. My kids would ride with me and I would do this. And as time passed, there developed some enemies to this opportunity to do this. They're called handheld devices. Phones, music, tablets, all those different things can be an enemy. But I think a creative parent can probably use those things in and of themselves as opportunities to enter into some discussion about life and be that life interpreter. I really think that's huge the job as a parent. When you lie down, parent as counselor, reading to kids, tucking kids into bed is a meaningful time for family. My wife was so good at that. I wanted to watch Monday Night Football. But I didn't. Too many parents miss the potential to build intimacy with their kids by just saying, hey, go to bed. It's time to go to bed. Off you go. There's an intimate moment there in that bedtime, and he talks about that. The last one is parent as coach, when you get up. When you get up. Getting up in the morning is like a blank page, isn't it, for life every day? We've been talking about that, you know, my brother-in-law had some brain surgery this week, and we've been saying, you know, he only has a few months left now, and we've been saying every day truly is precious, isn't it? So if every day is precious, to be a new blank page for your child and your grandchild's significance is very important. And he's, he mentions, you know, when a coach sends the kid out into the game, you want them to have their confidence up, right? You want them to be ready to go for the day. Oh, don't miss those opportunities. A few encouraging words, carefully spoken or written, can give children a sense of value and instill purpose in their day. You should ask yourself this question. What can I say or do to give them fuel for dealing with whatever they have to face today? I think we live harried lives when we miss those opportunities. Instead, we rush out the door and we miss that opportunity to send them off ready to go for the day. Here's the point. If families decided to take advantage of times already in their routine, the effort required to initiate interaction during those times would be minimal. The return could be enormous for that family because the influence of an engaged parent is really overwhelming in a child's life. I want to mention this. Earlier I, I was just quoting uh, Reggie Joyner. He asked a question that is very pertinent to Gen Z. And I, I used this quote in my remarks. I did a groundbreaking a few months ago. And I, uh, I, I got to make some remarks at it. And this is, I used this, this, uh, this comment, this question, really. It's a question. What are the limits to what can happen if the church, it's all of you, and the home, that's many of you, combine efforts for the sake of of impacting the next generation. 
What if the church and the home began to work off the same page for the sake of children? Now, for Joyner, that's where he gets the title of his book. It's like combining red, which is the church, and yellow, which is parenting. You come up with something new, and that's where he says, think orange for the sake of the children, for the sake of Gen Z. Now, in my opinion, a school, a church school, is one of the best ways to do this. And as we shall see, studies show that there's no better, no better way to do it. But I want to interject this now. I'm not here today to berate anyone over closing of MAS. I was a part of that process. It was a perfect storm of events that led to that decision. That said, I hope the day will come that we will reopen our school here. And maybe what we're talking about today will start that discussion for 2021 or 20, you know, 2020 or 2021 or at some point in the future. But if you think orange, if you really think orange and you combine your resources and work together, you have an opportunity to do more as a church and more than just parents in a church can do alone. And I want to look at that closely. Again, I have a slide that I can't show, but parents you have an average of about 3,000 hours a year to influence your child. That's it. 3,000 hours to sit, walk, lie down, and get up. Meaningful opportunities to influence your child. A church, what we're doing here today, coming together for corporate worship. I know church is more than that, but let's just say that. Let's just take that for, for argument's sake. About 40 hours. 80 if you include Sabbath school because we're going by the fact that not people don't come every week. Okay, that's a statistical certainty, that they don't come every week. A teacher, whether in private school or public school, whether in elementary or high school or college or wherever it might be, especially in elementary schools, has 1,260 hours a year to influence a child. So you are putting your child in an influential situation when you send them to school, wherever they go to school, whether it's public or private. In an SDA Christian school, what we want to do is to partner with parents and with churches for that, that meaningful time to make it impact Gen Z. As I said a moment ago, a church is one way to think orange. And while it's not my favorite color, I don't like orange very much. I like crimson a lot better. Okay? I have to admit, that when I think about it in these terms, orange is a powerful color because it's about combining resources and working together. Now, before I wrap up, I want to sh share this, this stat with you. They did the value genesis study a few years ago, and they've done it like three times. And the number one thing that students say is the most significant influence on their faith is attending an SDA school. And the only thing that is remotely close was the family that I grew up in. Important because they can, you can think orange in other ways. Pathfinders is thinking orange. Okay? Summer camp is thinking orange. There's other ways. Grandparents' faith, par parents' faith, all those things are really important, but they all trail the impact of attending a school. So I want to wrap up with this, and it's five things. I want to leave you with this. Five things that every kid needs. You, this is the most important part of the sermon. You have to take, this is the takeaway, okay? Five things that every kid needs, and it's interesting, I think, that you can supply all five of them if you think orange. All five. Especially if a school is in the mix. But here they are. Church, caregivers, wherever role you play in a child's life, listen up before you go today, okay? Here they are. You two can meet these needs now. doesn't matter whether we have a school in three years. You can meet them now, okay? Number one, every kid needs a really big guy that they can trust no matter what. Amen? Kids should grow up knowing that God is big enough to handle whatever they may face. As the song says, he's a big, big God with a big, big table. And we want our children and youth to know that. 
Number two, the second thing that every child needs, and this is huge for me personally and as a parent, someone who believes what they believe. Every child needs someone else, I should say, who believes what they believe. Kids need teachers and friends and classmates who will encourage them to grow in their faith. They need intergenerational friendships that will help them in that manner. This is a learning goal in our schools, and it should be a learning goal in our church. And as parents, we want to nurture that in our children. Number three, the third thing that every kid needs. Another voice saying the same things that the parents say. Another voice saying the same thing that the parents say. Boy, am I challenging my teachers on that one. We need to be excellent for God in this in our schools. As children grow older, it becomes more important to have other adults in their lives as spiritual mentors and leaders. That's why those 1,260 hours that my teachers teach in all the schools throughout this conference are so vital and so important if we're going to reach our, this generation. Number four, uncommon sense to help them make wise choices. God's point of view and his truth become the filter for kids' life and for them making decisions. The Adventist Christian worldview is what these children need, and we need to help make sure that they get it. An uncommon sense to help them make wise choices. We can't just throw them out there and hope they make wise choices. And the fifth thing that every kid needs, and i got to say, I've, I've, uh, I had one, one time I preached this a few weeks ago, and I had a kid walk up to me on the way out and say, no, Mr. Ob, we don't need this. Don't say that again. But this is it. This is the one. Nosy parents. Nosy parents who know where their kids are spiritually. <laughs> and he's like, no, Mr. Ross, we don't need nosy parents. Kids need parents who will be intentional about spending time together as a family and staying actively involved in their children's spiritual growth. I had a student of mine in Atlanta that broke my heart one time. He says, Mr. Ops, we never do anything as a family. Ever. I couldn't believe it. And I see so many of those kids. But you enter, uh, you, uh, here we are, teacher, friend, counselor, all these different things. We have an opportunity to be nosy where it really matters, don't we? Thinking orange impacts kids and shifts the tide of the battle in our favor. Before I sit down, I want to tell you this. I taught world geography to freshmen in Atlanta for the last 10 years that I was in the classroom. And one year I was uh, teaching and a young lady seemed to be struggling with a particular concept that I had them working on. Now this is world geography, not rocket science. Okay? But she was struggling with this little concept and I, I just was noticing that she seemed to be struggling. So I looked at her and I said, hey, you know, are you all right? Everyone else seemed to be doing fine. And so she looked up at me as if she was in physical pain. And she said, Mr. Hobbs, this is hard. You are making my brain hurt. And I just uh, couldn't help but laugh. But I thought, what a great compliment, right? She's thinking what we want our students to do. You know, thinking orange isn't easy. It's hard. There will always be challenges and difficulties along the way for the church and for parents, for the schools. We know that, don't we? After all, we're in a great controversy, not a small one. Paul said our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the cosmic powers of present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil. So do not let difficulty deter us. Worthwhile things are worth fighting for. And Nehemiah made that really clear. If you look in your bulletin, there's a text that I chose for today wasn't read beforehand, but that's okay. I want to close with it. Nehemiah was there to help these Israelites build this wall, and I'll leave you with his appeal. The words right out of the song, Soldiers of Christ Arise. Nehemiah said, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your sons and your daughters and your homes. 
So Montgomery, I just want to encourage you to think on it. Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Who? In Jesus. Oh, it, it, the whole thing's busted now? I think we need to use the hymnal, so let's turn to hymn number, what's the hymn number? 524. Father in heaven, I know we've unpacked a lot today because we want to reach this generation for you, every generation, every person that's out there. We want them to come to know you the way we know you. And we thank you for what you've done in our lives. We pray that you'll go with us now, continue to lead us, bless us. We thank you so much for Jesus and all that he's done for us and what he means to us individually and corporately. Oh, where would we be without Jesus? Help us to trust him more, Lord. It's my prayer in Jesus' name.